We're going to observe the Lord's table together tonight. I've entitled the message for this morning, The Trial of Your Faith. The testing, the trial of your faith. Now, I've had several weeks uh, to think about some messages I'd like to bring. I went four straight weeks without preaching. And so I've thought about some things, some messages for the next couple of weeks, two or three weeks I'd like to bring before I resume what I had been doing. And um, I've had a lot of time to think about this particular message. The trial, the testing of your faith. Look in verse 7, 1 Peter chapter 1, that the trial of your faith being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. The trial of your faith. Now listen to this statement real carefully. Everybody to ever live has some kind of faith. This is speaking to you. The trial of your faith. This is speaking to me, the trial of your faith. Everybody has some kind of faith, even atheists. What kind of faith do they have? Well, they don't believe in God. That's their faith. <laughs> Everybody has a type of faith. Everybody has something they believe. Well, I pray that God will cause that faith to be put on trial to be tried to see if it is real. Now, your faith will be tested. Your faith. Boys, girls, men and women, your faith will be tested to prove whether or not it is real. Let me read some other translations of this verse. The proving of your faith. The proven character of your faith. The genuineness of your faith. The tested genuineness of your faith. The proof of your faith. The, I like this, the true metal of your faith. The proven genuineness of your faith. Now those are all different translations that let us know something about what he means when he speaks of the trial of your faith. Your faith put on trial, my faith put on trial to see if it is real. Now, you and I will be continually tested to see if our faith looks to Christ alone. That's where you're going to be tested. You're going to be brought, things are going to be brought into your path all the time that will test whether or not your faith is real. Whether or not you truly look to Christ alone. Because you're going to be tempted not to. You're going to be tempted to look somewhere else. You're going to be tempted to look to yourself in some way. You're going to have all kinds of things that are going to be thrown at you that could be called the trying of your faith. Now, I think of what John said uh, when he talked about the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, the pride of life. That's all going to be thrown at you. The lust, the pleasure of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, 
being more concerned about what men think than what God sees. The pride of life, the desire for power to make you feel good about yourself. That's going to be thrown your way to seek to cause you to look somewhere other than Christ. I think of the parable of the sower. Remember the stony ground here? He received the word. He seemed to believe. He seemed to have faith. But when persecution arose because of the word, he fell away. I didn't sign up for this. I didn't expect this. Think about the thorn choked here. He received the word. But the cares of this life, the deceitfulness of riches, the lust of other things came in and choked the word. He failed. The test. When his faith was tried, it was made to be not real. Lord, try my faith. I want to know if it's not real. So by your grace, I will be enabled to believe the trial of your faith. Now let's read what led Peter to make this statement. Verse 1 of 1 Peter chapter 1. Peter, an apostle of Jesus Christ, to the strangers, scattered throughout Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia. Now one thing every believer knows is they're a stranger in this world. This world's not my home. I'm just passing through. I'm a stranger. And look what he says next. I love this. Elect, (laughs) according to the foreknowledge of God the Father. Uh, Matt was reading that passage of Scripture in Romans chapter 9, that great uh, passage with regard to election. And I remember uh, Henry Mahan saying one time that he got up and read that passage of Scripture with no comment. He just read Romans 9. And somebody stood up red-faced in anger and said, It doesn't mean that! (laughs) Oh. (laughs) Elect! Peter wasn't ashamed of election. He rejoiced in it. Rejoiced in the God of election. The God of all grace. Elect according to the foreknowledge whom he did foreknow. That foreknowledge doesn't mean simply he knew beforehand, he loved beforehand. Whom he did foreknow. Elect according to the foreknowledge of God the Father through sanctification of the Spirit unto obedience and sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. Now let me say this, that doesn't mean your obedience and the sprinkling of the blood of Jesus Christ. That's talking about his obedience. Don't dare think of your obedience and put it in the same verse as a sprinkling of his blood. That's talking about his obedience. The sprinkling, the saving power of his blood. Grace unto you and peace be multiplied. Verse 3. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, which according to his abundant Mercy hath begotten us again unto a lively hope by the resurrection of Jesus Christ from the dead. Now, here's why my hope lives. He lives. He was raised from the dead. The only hope I have is found in his resurrection, his life, his death, and his resurrection. And what hope there is in him. Two, an inheritance incorruptible and undefiled and that fadeth not away reserved in heaven for you who are kept by the power of God through faith. Now this is the faith that's going to be put on trial. 
through faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed in the last time, wherein you greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be. You are in heaviness through manifold temptations that the trial of your faith. That's so important. That the trial of your faith. Your faith is going to be tested by God. That the trial of your faith being much more precious than that of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. Now, from Peter's writings, God the Holy Spirit's writings, he used Peter to do it, but he uses this word precious, the trying of your faith being more precious than gold. That's what everybody's interested in, money and the things money gets, the love of money. It's the root of all evil. Well, faith is infinitely more precious than gold, infinitely. That the trying of your faith, and he uses the word precious four other times in this two epistles, 1 Peter and 2 Peter. And from these four precious things, the trying of your faith is precious, precious. There's four precious things that give the marks of saving faith. And if my faith doesn't have these four marks, my faith doesn't pass the test. Wherever there is saving faith, wherever there's faith that's the gift of God's grace, true saving faith, there will always, without exception, be these four marks. Now, proven faith, faith that God has tried, that has passed the test, it has a source, it has a ground, it has knowledge, and it has an object. Wherever there's true faith, there's a source, a place from which that faith comes from. There is a ground, a reason. There is a knowledge. Faith always has knowledge. There's no faith without knowledge. And it has an object. The source of faith, what's going to be found in 1 Peter 1, 1, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Now that is the source of faith. You obtained it. That means somebody gave it to you. If you have faith, it has a source. Somebody gave it to you. You didn't decide to believe. Somebody says, well, I've made a decision to believe. You know, that's foolishness. You don't decide to believe. You find yourself believing. There was a time when you couldn't believe. You didn't even know what it meant to believe. You'd hear, believe, and you'd think, what's that mean? And then you found yourself believing. You didn't choose to believe. Really, you believed because you had no choice. That's when you believe, when you have no other options. That's the source of faith. And then there's the ground of faith. 2 Peter 1, 4, Unto us are given exceeding great and precious promises. Promises by God. That's the ground of faith because God said it. Because God promised it. The only reason I have a right to believe something is because it's what God said. God promised it. And then there is the knowledge of saving faith. You know Peter said, you know that you were not redeemed by corruptible things. You know that. You were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. 
Now, everybody that has faith that has been tried knows this. The reason they're redeemed is not because of anything they did. You're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And what is the object of this faith that is tried? Well, Peter once again said in 1 Peter 2, 7, to you that believe, he is precious. That is the object of faith that passes the test. That is what Peter called faith unto salvation, ready to be revealed. To you that believe, here's the mark. He, he is precious. Now that's what we're going to consider, these four marks that will prove the reality of our faith. Now first, the source of faith that passes the test. Second Peter chapter 1. Verse 1, Simon Peter, a servant and an apostle of Jesus Christ, to them that have obtained like precious faith. Now the word obtained is defined in the Greek dictionary like this, to receive by divine allotment. That's the literal meaning of the word. To receive by divine allotment. Now, if you haven't received it, he never gave it. Is that clear? Somebody says the act of reception is the act of faith. No, it's not. If he gives, you receive. And if you have not received, he never gave it. Those who receive this gift, this is the source of faith. It's God. It's not your free will. It's not a decision you make. It's not a choice you make. It's not the act of reception. Faith is the gift of God. That is its source. Ephesians 2, 8, 9 says, For by grace are you saved through faith, and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast. It's like precious faith. You know, all of God's elect have the same faith. Now, some may have stronger faith than others, but you know the weakest faith in the world saves because it's the gift of God. And all faith is alike in the sense that we believe the same thing. I remember hearing a, a song once. It says, we all believe, but not the same thing. Well, I reckon that's true, but it's not saving faith. Uh, we all believe the same thing. We all believe Christ is all. You believe that? Christ is all. That is the gift of God. I love the way Paul called it in Titus 1.1, 1, 1, the faith of God's elect. Now those who have faith, all, without exception, know its source. It didn't come from me. It didn't come because I decided to believe. It didn't come because I decided to accept Jesus Christ as my personal Savior. You know, I despise that kind of language. I decided to accept you. That's so foolish. Oh, you've decided to accept him. Congratulations. That's wicked. You don't talk about the Lord like that. He's the God of glory. Oh, I'm going to accept him. That's not the issue. Will he accept you? Will he do something for you? Now, if you have faith that passes the test, 
This you will be assured of. If you have it, he gave it to you. You know that. I don't have to convince anybody of that that has faith. If you have faith, you know its source. It's the gift of God. Now the next point that will determine whether or not our faith is genuine and will pass the test is what is its ground? Upon what basis do we believe? You know, faith is called by the writer to the Hebrews in Hebrews 11.1, 1, the substance of things hoped for. The evidence of things not seen. Now, I have a hope that all my sins, even the ones I haven't committed yet, are forgiven. I have a hope that I stand before God right now while I'm talking to you having never sinned. And I will never sin. That's what the Bible calls justification. If you're justified before God, that means you stand before God without guilt, perfectly righteous. I have a hope that when I stand before God in judgment, I'll be accepted by Him. He's going to say to me, well done, thou good and faithful servant. I really believe he's going to say that to me. And let me give you a hint. It isn't because I feel that way about myself. If Christ did well, I did well. That's where that comes from. And I have a hope that everything that happens between now and then and everything that happened before now is working together for my good and his glory. Romans 8, 28, we know that all things work together for good to them that love God, to them who are the called according to his purpose. You know, if you go on reading in verse 8, it says, with regard to the Lord Jesus Christ in verse Peter 1, whom having not seen, you love. Now these things that I've talked about, having the hope that all my sins are forgiven, that I stand just before God, that I'm going to be accepted on judgment day and everything that happens to me is going to be for my good and his glory. I can't see any of that. I can't see that I'm just before God. It's not something I can see. Well, you look at me. Yeah, I, I can't see I've never sinned because in my experience, that's all I do. I can't see these things. So upon what ground will I believe that these things are true with regard to me. What gives me the right? How would I dare believe that I'm without sin before God? Only one reason. Because God said it. 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby, 2 Peter chapter 1, verse 4. Whereby are given unto us. Given. Not just thrown out there and offered given, given, the gift of God. Who is the us? Whereby are given unto us the same us as if God be for us, who can be against us? Whereby are given unto us exceeding great and precious promises that by these, by these Precious promises, you might be partakers of the divine nature. Having escaped the corruption that's in the world through lust. Now, exceeding great and precious promises. I could show so many scriptures about how salvation is according to the promise of God. But let me give you this one. Galatians 3.18. If the inheritance be of the law, it's no more promise. If eternal glory... And salvation, the inheritance of heaven, be according to the law. By what you've done, it just negates the promise of God. But God gave it to Abraham. 
by promise. Now, I've, here's a scripture I want to quote that is, summarizes all these exceeding great and precious promises. This summarizes all of them. In 2 Samuel chapter 23, verse 5, the dying words of David. David's dying, and he knows it. It says these be the last words of David. This is what David, the man of God's own, after God's own heart, this is how he summarized these great and precious promises. He said in verse 5, Although my house be not so with God, yet hath he made with me an everlasting covenant ordered in all things and sure. This is all my salvation and all my desire, though he maketh it not to grow. Now what did David mean when he said, although my house be not so with God? Now most people, when they think about that, they think, well, that's talking about David's kids, some of his wives, I mean, David had more problems in his house than Kellogg's has cornflakes. <laughs> Nobody else like that? But you know what? That's not what David was talking about. He wasn't talking about the problems with his kids. Because, you know, he had some kids that it was so with him. Solomon. Scripture says the Lord loved Solomon. I mean, he had Michael for a while, but he also had Abigail. Boy, she was a fine, wonderful woman that feared the Lord. So when he says, although my house be not so with God, he's not talking about his relatives. He's talking about this house. He's talking about his old man. He's talking about his old nature. It's not so with God. And you're aware of that if you're a believer. Although my house be not so with God yet, he hath made with me an everlasting covenant. He made this covenant before time began. And it's ordered in all things. All the promises of God in him are yea and amen. And sure, and David said, this is all my salvation. Can you say that? This is all my salvation. Not only is it all my salvation, it's all my desire. I don't want anything else. Though he maketh it not to grow. That's the only faith that will stand the test that has as its source what God has said. The promises of God in the gospel. Now thirdly, the knowledge of faith. First Peter 1 Peter 1.18, For as much as you know. Don't miss that. You know this. I love uh, all the we knows and you knows of the scripture. Like I love when Paul says, and we know. That all things work together for good. Well, how do you know, Paul? Well, that's, that's, that's who God is. And somebody says, well, I don't know that. Well, I do. I do. Paul is speaking as a spokesman for every believer when he says, we know. We know. Peter says, you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. Now, corruptible things is everything but God. Isn't that so? Anything that's not God is corruptible. God the Father is not corruptible. God the Son is not subject to corruption. He can't sin. God the Holy Spirit is not subject to corruption. He's the Holy Spirit. That which is born of God is not subject to corruption. The new man. Look in 1 Peter chapter 3. Hold your finger there. Verse 4. But let it be the hidden man of the heart in that which is, what's it say? Not corruptible. The new nature is not even subject to corruption. 
It cannot sin. Now, you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things. That's anything that's not God. I don't care what it is. Such as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by tradition from your fathers. You know, you, you know that that traditional religion of man is nothing but a bunch of vain garbage. You know that, don't you? You weren't redeemed by corruptible things. But here's what you know. You were redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. You know that. As of a lamb without blemish and without spot who verily was foreordained before the foundation of the world but was manifest in these last times for you. You know you were redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. Now, Christ did not try to redeem. Christ did not make redemption possible. Christ redeemed. Everybody he died for is redeemed. Now, I can't express sufficiently my contempt for that preaching that says that Jesus Christ died for everybody without exception and some of those people that he died for will not be saved. Now if you believe that, if you preach that, you believe in salvation by works. You've never believed the gospel. The gospel is it is finished. Christ hath redeemed us from the curse of the law being made a curse for us. When he had by himself purged our sins. No help from you. He didn't ask you if you would accept this. You wasn't even born. When he had by himself purged our sins, he sat down having finished the work at the right hand of God. You see, his blood is called precious blood because of whose blood it is. Somebody may think, how can the blood of just one man save so many millions? Because of whose blood it is. That's why. We're not to, you know, if I died for you, you know how much good it would do you? Not a bit. Not a bit. If he dies for you, you're redeemed. Your salvation is an absolute necessity. You know you were not redeemed with corruptible things, but with the precious blood of Christ. I love the way he says, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, he never sinned. That's why he can redeem you. And he was verily foreordained before the foundation of the world. Peter brings that out too. You see, this has always been the purpose. Before there was ever a sinner, there was a Savior. And he's the lamb slain from the foundation of the world. Now, where faith is genuine, there is this knowledge. And you know, if you know that, you know everything else, don't you? You're redeemed with the precious blood of Christ. And finally, the object of the faith that passes the test, 1 Peter chapter 2, I want to begin reading in verse 4. To whom coming. Now that is the life of faith. You're coming to Christ. Now why does a man come to Christ? Well, because he's drawn. Because he's drawn. No man can come to me except the Father which has sent me drawing. And when you're drawn, you come because you're a sinner. That's why you come to Christ. You never come to him as a good man. You come to him in your need. You come to him because you really have no choice. You don't have anywhere else to go. To whom coming? As unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, disapproved of men. Men rejected him. But you know if you come to him, you know how much uh, bearing that has on you? Nothing. Somebody says, I reject Christ. 
It doesn't change the truth of who he is in any way. It's a, you know, somebody says, I, I, do, I don't believe him. You know, that, that doesn't intimidate me. Um, okay, you know, <laughs> you believe what you want. But he is, I don't care if men do disallow him, he's still chosen of God. He's God's elect. He's precious to God. Disallowed in need of men, but chosen of God and precious. Ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. I love the way the writers in the New Testament always say, by Jesus Christ. You're not even going to talk about anything to be accepted apart from him. Verse 6, wherefore also it's contained in the scripture. Behold, I lay in Zion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious. And he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. Now, here is the object of our faith. He is precious. And I, you know, that deserves a whole sermon, doesn't it? Uh, I've, I've run out of time. But um, you, he is so precious to me. Uh, and the reason being, he's precious to God. And he's precious to me in that he is my salvation. He is my salvation. I'm looking to him the same way God looks to him. In this sense, God looks to him for everything in my salvation. He doesn't look for a thing out of me. He looks to him. You know what? I do too. And because of that, he is the object of my faith. Not my faith. I don't look... I don't look backward to my experience. I don't look at you to see how I compare to you. I look to him. He is precious. Precious in his suretyship. Precious in his life. Precious in his person. Precious in his death. Precious in his resurrection. Precious in his ascension. He is precious. I love this uh, acronym, FAITH. F-A-I-T-H, forsaking all, I trust him. That's what faith is, forsaking all. I don't, by his grace, I'm not looking for a thing out of myself. <laughs> forsaking all, I trust him. Now, the faith that passes the test, the trial of your faith, has God as its source, always, and you know it. And its ground is the promise of God, the Word of God. Its knowledge is, you know you're redeemed by the precious blood of Christ. And its object, Christ himself. Now, wherever, wherever that is, there is faith that passes the test, the trial of your faith. Let's pray. Lord, we ask in the high and holy name of thy Son that we might have this precious gift of your grace, saving faith. Lord, we ask that we might found our faith only in what you have promised. And Lord, we look to the precious blood of your Son as all that's needed to make us acceptable in your sight. And Lord, we confess he is the object of our faith. He is our peace. He is our life. He is our all in all. We look to him. Bless this message for Christ's sake. In his name we pray.